am Dana Seitler, and I'm the director of the Bonham Center uh, for Sexual Diversity Studies. And I welcome you all to um, our event, which is going to be celebrating Julietta Singh's The Breaks. I am speaking to you from the University of Toronto. It, it's itself a physical and intellectual structure enabled by land theft and the violences of settler colonialism. And I speak to you as a white settler of this land, which is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Patoon First Nations, the Mississaugas of the Credit River, and the nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Ojibwe, Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. The Dish with One Spoon Agreement recognizes that we live off of the same resources, hence protocols are put in place to ensure mutual respect and accountability to each other and to the land. Today, the meeting place of Toronto or Takaranto is still the home to Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. Our intersecting communities are comprised of those native to this land, Indigenous people from other territories, as well as settlers who have come here by choice, force, or otherwise a result of colonialism and imperialism. We are all treaty people and are responsible for honoring and upholding these treaty agreements. I'm grateful for the opportunity to live and work on this territory and to share space today with all of you. And indeed, I'm thrilled that so many of you have joined us. Um, as always, I wanna thank um, Valley Wedick and Victoria Liao for helping with this event. Most of all, um, or in addition, most of all, I want to thank you all equally, <laughs> but I also want to thank Nays Dave for organizing the entire thing. And um, so now I will have the pleasure to introduce Nays to you. Uh, Nays Dave is uh, Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Toronto. Dave's research concerns um, Davi's research concerns emergent forms of politics and relationality in contemporary urban India. Her first book, Queer Activism in India, a story in the anthropology of ethics, examines the relationship between queer desires and queer political formations. Her second book, book tentatively, uh, tentatively entitled The Social Skin, Humans and Animals in India, is a study of human-animal relationality in Indian cities, including Delhi, Mumbai and uh, uh, Hyder Hyderabad. Nays will be your moderator today, and I thank her very much for being here. Thank you so much, Dana and uh, Victoria, and to the Bonham Center for sponsoring today's event. Uh, as Dana mentioned, I'm Nays Dave, Professor of Anthropology at the University of Toronto. Um, it's my pleasure to host this forum in celebration of Julieta Singh's The Breaks. If I may be indulged a personal note before I arrive to the formal introductions, I'll say that I first encountered Julietta's work through the glorious days of reading No Archive Will Restore You. Uh, here was this queer South Asian woman with ties to both Canada and the United States, with all of this remarkable stuff to say about animals and eating and sex and books. It was one of those rare and lovely experiences where you read something and know you'd be friends with the author were you ever to meet. And as it happens, one of the few bright spots of the pandemic was indeed becoming friends with Julietta, a relationship we once referred to as fan friends. I think we're just regular friends now, but of course with a healthy smattering of fandom. I'll say too that it is so nourishing to become friends with someone who think so deeply and creatively about adjacencies, queer affinities, and the architectures of being and not being together with others in space and time. Julieta Singh is Associate Professor at the University of Richmond. She works and teaches across the fields of decolonial studies, queer studies, the ecological humanities, and creative nonfictions. She is the author of three books, Unthinking Mastery, Dehumanism and Decolonial Entanglements from Duke University Press in 2018, which has become a touchstone for scholars and artists grappling with the politics of mastery, which drive our professional, political, and personal pursuits. She is also the author of Nor Archive Will Restore You, published by Punctum Books in 2018, which turns theory into creative praxis through an experimental meditation on the body as plural and porous archive. Her newest work is The Breaks uh, from Coffeehouse Press in 2021, in which Singh pens a letter to her young daughter about race, inheritance, 
and queer mothering at the end of the world. It has been hailed as the best nonfiction book of the year by such entities as the New York Public Library, Book Riot, and the Seminary Co-op Bookstore. We are privileged to encounter the breaks today through the eyes and the interlocution of one of the great poets of our time, Natalie Diaz. Natalie Diaz is Mojave and an enrolled member of the Gila River Indian tribe. Her first poetry collection, When My Brother Was an Aztec, was published by Copper Canyon Press, and her second book, Postcolonial Love Poem, was published by Grey Wolf Press in 2020, for which she won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry in 2021. She is a MacArthur Fellow, a Lannan Literary Fellow, a United States Artist Ford Fellow, and a Native Arts Council Foundation Artist Fellow. Diaz is director of the Center for Imagination in the Borderlands and is the Maxine and Jonathan Marshall Chair in Modern and Contemporary Poetry at Arizona State University. She lives in Phoenix, Arizona. Finally, as a sports fan <clears throat> in the month of March, I cannot let this event pass without noting that Natalie Diaz played point guard for Old Dominion University, where she helped lead her team to the NCAA Final Four once, and the Sweet 16 not once, not twice, but three times besides. One final practical matter before we begin, uh, please use the Q&A function to pose a question to either or both of the speakers. Um, when the Q&A session begins, I'll read those aloud, time permitting, unless you indicate otherwise. When the question and answer session begins, you may also use the raise hand function to indicate you would like to be unmuted and ask a question directly to our speakers. We welcome and even prefer this mode. With that, I now turn it over to Julieta Singh in conversation with Natalie Diaz. Please join me in welcoming them. Thanks so much for the introduction, Nais, and you promised me in advance of this that you weren't gonna gush. <laughs> and then you gushed and almost made me cry. So let me start by saying thanks to the Bonham Center, to Dana and Victoria for hosting and orchestrating all of this, um, as well as to Daniel, who is um, working as our interpreter, and Joy, who will be joining him, um, also to whoever it is who's doing the closed captioning for today. Um, all of you widen our reach and allow us to become more together, and I'm deeply appreciative of you being here with us. Nace, uh, you've already explained our, our becoming, our emerging. Um, you were one of the first people to read this book um, back in the early, early summer months. In fact, I sent you a book. You did not receive it. <laughs> and I sent you another book. Um, and I was waiting vulnerably and fairly to, to hear how you liked it. And it didn't arrive. But then it arrived. And we've been planning this ever since. And for reasons that are totally intuitive to all of us. Now, um, by way of the pandemic, it's taken some time to get here, but I'm really delighted. Wish that we were together in, in person, in bodies, but um, I'm very honored to be here. Um, I also, before I read, wanna say a very special thank you to Natalie for uh, joining in conversation with me today. Hi, Natalie, thanks for coming back. <laughs> um, Natalie and I have been having a lot of conversations about care and how we spend our time. And it's especially meaningful to me um, to have your care in this regard and to be spending this particular time with you. So thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna give everybody a break from, from being seen while I read. I'm gonna jump around um, in the breaks, which some of you know, takes the form of a long letter to my young daughter about race, inheritance and mothering at the end of the world. Um, but is in fact an uplifting book, even though that tagline makes it seem fairly despairing. Um, so I'll hop around from the first 20 or so pages from the book. In the run-up to Thanksgiving last year, you learned a whitewashed story at school about how the first peoples of this land were happy to give their sacred spaces to the consumptive force of European men in the name of civilization and progress. You came home from school and unzipped your backpack, revealing with artistic pride a picture book you had colored and stapled yourself. Your kindergarten teacher had asked you to color in a little Native American girl, then a Native American boy, followed by a pilgrim girl and boy, 
each one garbed in their traditional attire. I admired the craft of your book, a swell of parental pride coursing through me as I witnessed the evidence of my progeny doing and making things in the world beyond me. And I relished that you had colored all four children brown like you. As you flipped through the pages of your book, you narrated a sad story about how much the pilgrims had suffered when they arrived on this land. I felt a surge in my body, an immediate unstoppable need to explain the other forms of suffering alighted by this disturbingly singular narrative. I described some of the impacts of this arrival on indigenous peoples, the European theft of their autonomies, cultures, languages, and lands. I explained that colonial practices dramatically changed how humans live in relation to this land. And I told you that this historical moment of colonial contact was crucial to understanding how we have arrived at the global, global ecological crisis we face today. I'll never forget the way you looked at me then, your head slightly tilted to one side, your eyes wide in bewilderment. We were sitting on the landing at the top of the apartment stairs, the contents of your backpack scattered around us. This is not what my teacher told us, he said with unmistakable agitation. I knew that for the first time you were confronting the existence of conflicting worldviews, a vital gulf between your formal education and your maternal one. That's okay, I said. My job as your mother is to tell you these stories differently and tell, to tell you other stories that don't get told at school. I pressed on to explain that history is a story based on a version of the past. Can you hear the word story in history, I asked. You nodded slowly, a little body in deep rumination. These stories need to be told from the perspectives of those who have been most damaged by history. These other stories, I said, can teach us how to keep living. From the onset of your public education, you have been learning what it means to be American through a manicured version of history that keeps European whiteness at its center. This form of education willfully forgets the lives that were destroyed, the bodies that were brutalized, and the cultures and traditions that were abolished or displaced to establish that center space. It tells you a, single, a, a singular and continuous narrative of Western capitalist expansion, obscuring the bleak fact that much of what we call progress has been a direct and unrelenting line to the wholesale destruction of the earth. Against this obliterating narrative, I glean from the fragments in an attempt to teach us otherwise. I scramble to harvest alternative histories omitted by the textbooks, the histories of those who have faced annihilation and lived towards survival. Learning to mother at the end of the world is an infinite toggle between wanting to make you feel safe and needing you to know that the earth and its inhabitants are facing a catastrophic crisis. This morning, you went off to school to learn discipline, to hone your reading and writing skills, to study official state history. I am sitting at my desk, sipping tea, turning over words. The birds are chirping outside my window. You, me, the birds. We are all creatures living as though we have a future, as though tomorrow will continue to resemble today. Meanwhile, plans are being devised to drive the marketplace forward when the Earth's non-renewable resources are exhausted. Scientists and businessmen are plotting to colonize the moon in a relentless drive to create an alternative human habitat when this one can no longer foster us. There is no consideration of ceasing extraction, only a maniacal mission to discover other worlds to plunder. When the Earth is rendered uninhabitable, when extractive capitalism leads to wholesale ecological collapse, we will not be chosen for this new other planetary world. We, along with nearly everyone else, will be left in ecological destruction to scavenge what we can from the wreckage or to perish. The truth is, I am glad not to be among the chosen ones. I know in my body the cost of discovering new worlds, 
the brutal violence that accompanies the colonial mission. No, I do not want to leave this planet. What I want is another world. And when I say another world, I mean this one, toppled and reborn. On the sixth day of a nine day work trip, the longest period I have been away from you, I FaceTime home and find you deeply engaged in an act of fruit sculpting. You tell me you're making a Powhatan village. The Powhatan people are represented by banana slices and apple skins make up their shelters. Off to the side of the village, you have crafted colonial ships by slicing kiwis in half, gutting their insides and attaching the skins to the little fruit boats to serve as sails. You have created rough waters out of banana peels and a wall of carved apple manatees that surround the kiwi ships on three sides. What's happening in this scene, I ask. The rough waters and manatees are pushing the Europeans back home, you reply earnestly. I am blown away to witness this art making against the state, this anti-colonial fruit installation that is also a fantasy of organically reversing history. What I love most is that in your historical revisioning, you move us beyond the subjugated histories of indigenous resistance to colonial force. Instead, you turn your attention to the sea, letting it emerge as an actor in the opposition to the colonial mission. Your artwork veers me away from the anthropocentric position, carefully and imaginatively invoking what the earth itself might desire. Last year, as we walked to school hand in hand through the lush green streets of Richmond, Virginia, you asked me with stark curiosity whether you would have been a slave had you lived here in another time. The question did not come as an absolute surprise because I knew you had been studying Abraham Lincoln and Thomas Jefferson in kindergarten. Only months into your formal education and you are already immersed in a top-down history that tells you black folks became free through the noble gestures of white presidential slave owners. This history slyly refuses to include the resistance from below that has always made freedom possible. It is a history that will not tell you how hard and through what means black and brown people have fought to be free, how crushing the blows of European progress have been to those subjugated to its force. Your question was hard for me to answer because its limbs extended in so many directions, because it required not a single answer, not a reductive no or yes, but a careful inventory of moving bodies. Some of those bodies came with colonial minds. Some were discovered here and brutally eradicated or displaced. Some were captured from elsewhere and forced across the ocean. And others came from distant lands to save or improve their lives. At its root, your question was a way of asking where your body fits into the racial economy of this nation. And the answer to that question must necessarily be a dynamic one. I tightened my grip on your hand, slowed our pace and drew you close. I told you that people like us did not live here during the time of slavery. But already I was wondering about the words I had used people like us. Who was this us I had summoned to make sense of things for you? At the time, I had undoubtedly meant those critically impacted by the force and manipulation of British colonialism in India. But my utterance also implicated the Jews who were exterminated and those who narrowly escaped the Nazi camps. Our blood is laced with modern histories of unbelievable violence. It is a strange and hybrid brew that you will feel in your body across your life, as I have always felt it in mine. Our particular histories are, tho are those of imperial conquest, mass extermination, and nearly unimaginable forms of racial and religious violence. But here in America, it is toward the local histories of genocide, slavery, forced religious and cultural conversion and internment that we must reach in solidarity. 
each of us who emerges from the subjugated ends of history, who stands outside whiteness but is also saturated by its power, share something not only at the surface of our bodies, but also deep within them. I am writing to you and to future you. I am writing to the six-year-old girl you are now, the one who both insists on her unequivocal need for my body and loves to perform her independence from me. I am writing also to the becoming being that you are, the one who will face a world in ruin and undoubtedly wonder over my place in all this destruction. Over half a century ago, James Baldwin repeatedly wrote and tore up drafts of a letter penned to his nephew and namesake until he was able to articulate the plain, pitiless fact that the younger James would face profound struggle for no other reason but the fact of his blackness. More recently, ta Coates followed Baldwin to elucidate for his son the brutal truth of state violence inflicted against black bodies. It is no coincidence that both Baldwin and Coates have felt an urgency to write to 15 year old boys tipping into manhood. Their black paternal mouths spilling with revolutionary promise as they equip their boys to face a criminal justice system designed to exploit and devour them. I write to you with a different urgency. I write not with the immediate fear that you will be gunned down by police in the streets or that you will be metabolized by the prison industrial complex, but with an adjacent set of fears about being a brown girl in a country that thinks and feels race through a sharp binary. I write with an impossible desire to prepare you for political and ecological catastrophe. I write because the burden of history, the indispensable need to keep us all from coming apart, keeps falling on the shoulders of girls and women of color. I write because as mother and daughter, we are unmistakably entwined. And because I know, which is to say that I feel in the most microbial registers of my body, that the shape of our entwinement will need to be radically reformed as we fight global patriarchy, extractive capitalism, and indiscriminate planetary destruction. I am turning over a question I cannot yet answer against political and corporate systems that are plunging us full speed toward total ecological destruction. What will ultimately make our bodies gather and surge against them? Will we physically revolt against these systems using our collective might to raise them to the ground? Or will we find another way to exercise our willful bodies in resistance? Can we withdraw ourselves en masse, bodies and minds, refusing to feed a system that thrives on our habits and labor, our lifestyles, our instilled consumptive desires? Marx once predicted that the bourgeoisie would never be the source of a class revolution because they had too much to lose. They would cling to their property and the forms of individual freedom they held so dear. History has shown us that few of us who benefit from the order of things are willing to compromise what we have for the good of the whole. If a class revolution was to come, Marx foresaw, it would have to come from the proletariat, the underclasses who had little to lose, who in having little to lose would have the impetus to change the course of history. The revolution, in other words, was not gonna come from people like me. But shouldn't the immediate threat of human extinction trump the Marxist formulation of class revolution? Shouldn't knowing that extinctions are everywhere underway lead us to demolish the effacing forces that produce it? Regardless of class status, shouldn't the very fact of being your mother mean I am already sharpening my knives, fighting tooth and nail for our lives? In Lose Your Mother, Saidiya Hartman chronicles her journey to the African motherland, a journey that turns out to be less a homecoming than a series of discomforting estrangements. Hartman's journey provokes us to consider the critically incomplete and sometimes even false stories of our pasts, urging us to think otherwise about our inheritances. 
Every generation confronts the task of choosing its past, she writes. Inheritances are chosen as much as they are passed on. I think of you each time I read these words. Think of all we know about our history and all that has been omitted. Think of what you will choose from the past in pursuit of a future we might yet survive. I think also of the role of the mother and of losing her in the political act of culling from history and discarding what does not serve you. For as unabashedly attached as we are, I accept that you will need to loosen our bond as you make your way into the world. I'm not squeamish about this development, this developmental loosening. I know that we must lose our mothers, often only later and in a perverse twist to become them in ways we may not be able to predict or appreciate. It is less the inevitability of our break than it is the shape and force of it that haunts me. I know it is not just me you will need to break from, but the entire way of life that I represent. However liberally filled with reused plastic bags, farmer's market purchases and composting practices, this form of life is ushering us and everyone else toward the end of the world. More than any other time in history, what you choose from the past will need to be meticulously studied and selected. You will need to read beyond the official archives with a keen understanding that resistance, collective action, and stories of survival against all odds have been discarded by the grand narratives of history. You will need to call carefully from the intimate and political pasts that have shaped your life, and you will need to draw respectfully from other histories of subjugation that are not yours, but have had no less a hand in shaping you. You will need to discover and learn from these fragments, from ancient stories and lost practices, from the hints and traces of lives lived otherwise, from forms of resistance already underway that are not yet perceptible to you. If following Hartman, inheritances are as much chosen as they are passed on, I feel urgently compelled to offer myself to you and all in all my complicity and failure, inviting you to pick and choose from your maternal history what is important for you in the service of ongoing human life. What you will discover is a history of insufficiencies, of nearly unbelievable forms of denial, of living much more with than against the violently consumptive status quo. I hope that in sifting through my past, you might also stumble on obscure moments that lead you nearer to and elsewhere. Losing me, my way of life, is unquestionably a requisite to survival and futurity. Yet I hope with every thread of my being that this world altering shift can become a form of breaking that does not sever us entirely or wrench us into mutual unbelonging. My most intimate desire is that you find a way to break with me rather than to break from me. A desire in which the necessity of our breaking does not so much leave me behind in your struggle to survive as it invites me in and calls me to blaze alongside you. I yearn for our imminent break to be not an end, but an act of, of profound and collective renewal. In these early years of your life, I whisper to you a mantra in your sleep with the passionate hope that it will embolden you. Break with me, break with me, break with me. I have moved beyond the initial impulse to apologize to you for planetary crisis. I offer less an apology than a wish for an us that is not yet us. An us who will teach and learn together what I have not been bold desperate or visionary enough to accomplish. An us that is joined not through biological or habitual belonging, not even through our mutual love, but through a passionate will to make life enduringly livable. In other words, an us that is willing to put our whole selves on the line, to abandon what we are and the world we have inherited in an unflinching effort to change the whole of it. stop there and invite Natalie back into the room.
Good to see you with my face. Gracias for that beautiful um, reading. It's this I've been piecing together hearing the book read across some of your other readings. Um, always a yeah. always a hodgepodge. <laughs> <laughs> that was beautiful to hear. Um, I I mean we can kind of uh, I mean one I'm joining you all from from one of my homelands, so it's good to be able to um, to join you all here, especially uh, Julieta alongside the breaks and. I think some of the the questions it's asking and some of the pathways it's giving us to return to um, to a place that is not dislocated um, and to, into place itself. And I I think something that I want to if you're okay with with me starting and and kind of I'm okay with you just taking it away. You know? <laughs> um, I heard those of barking by the way. So. You did. I try I tried to <laughs> mute it by will, but yeah. I didn't think it worked. The parrots have been moved out of the building, so okay. we won't hear them. We both have uh, animal houses that are properly disruptive. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm thinking a lot about, about mothering, right? Um, I mean, of course, we have this very straightforward relationship of mother-daughter. And I think something that uh, is important about the pressure you're putting on that is that mothering becomes a relationship, a, re a relationality, mm -hmm. and other way to, to relate. Um, and it becomes something more than uh, like a gender power dynamic, you know, mm -hmm. that it's always been. And I think in a lot of ways, it, it becomes maybe even more about blood mm -hmm. um, in terms of that relationality, more about the ways that we might um, deeply and intensely um, think of our connection as being beyond just our kind of flesh bodies. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking of, of like a, a term I know you've heard me use, but this this idea of of being of consequence to one another, mm -hmm. um, and and what that means, and and how how we are all in some ways mothering one another, mm -hmm. and you know I feel like I'm I have no children, I'm one of eleven, and I feel like I'm constantly learning how to uh, how to mother in relationship, which means you know to care, to tend, to be rigorous. Um, and so I'm, I'm thinking a little bit about, about that as well as um, I, I'm thinking about motherness, mothering in relationship to queerness too, and the, the, the ways that that has been dislocated mm -hmm. and kind of set to this traditional uh, power structure of mother, daughter, mother, child, mother, son. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, do you want to kind of crack that open a little bit? Because it feels like an important pathway for us to begin walking down, I think, to yeah. disrupt a little bit of that. Yeah. Um you've said a lot of things that I want to hit on. So remind me if I, if I miss anything mothering in relation to queerness, but the thir first thing I think I wanted to say was, you know, I think one of the conceits of the book is, yeah, it's about a specific relation. Of course, it's a letter to my kid, but it's a, a letter to my kid that is um, trying to think about motherhood as you're saying in a, in a, in a much more capacious way, which is not singular and not, individual or individuated but to to take up mothering um as i say in the book through conversations with my co-parent nathan um to take up mothering or to take up parenting as life's most prolonged and sustained act of pedagogy and so this really asks us to think about what a decolonial pedagogy looks like which to my mind is always not not about the imparting of knowledge from oneself to another, but a way of undoing the structures that hold us all um, in in negative ways, right? In 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 forceful inherited ways that we we want to learn together how to how to untether ourselves from. So I think mothering and pedagogy for me are really crucial pedagogy in that decolonial sense of like not inheriting from a teacher to a, a student or a master to a subject, but rather a kind of collective undoing in which a kind of nurturing and a kind of holding is the center of the, of the experience. And I think on the question of queer mothering, I mean, this may be a very strange thing to say because I'm always so concerned with undoing the sense of the individual or the sense of the singular. And I think mothering, you know, by by way of a, um, a as a structure or as a term, no matter how limited or capaciously we make it, is always about another, <laughs> at least another, right? And and I think that there's something really interesting in in thinking about mothering or queer mothering. Um, insofar as we 
like, as you're saying, I'm one of 11 and I'm not a mother, but I'm always mothering. And to say, like, I feel your mothering, I feel your care. And I think the term mothering is so, so much more expansive and so much more ecological than we've been taught to understand. Um, and so there's something really interesting for me in, in, in the kind of detachment of mothering from reproduction, right? Um, or certainly like heteronormative forms of reproduction, but also to think about the ways that we need to learn those of us who have lived under the force of, of colonialism and, and settler colonialism and white supremacy or the, the legacies of colonization elsewhere to learn how to mother ourselves, right? Like how to, how to like understand ourselves as not singular subjects, but like also entities that deserve that kind of hold that kind of care. Um, and then to say, you know, that I that I think most vitally in terms of mothering for me, this book is like, I think maybe one way that it could be picked up is as a book about like radical mothering, whatever that whatever that term might mean, but that I see it actually as a as a way or a style of learning how to become a mother. Um, in that most expansive term, learning how to mother, which is in which is in no sense intuitive, given the world that we've we've been born into, and the world that we've known, the world that we've lived in, and the other worlds that are made possible, um, you know, through through contact with with other people and other cultures and other ways of knowing that haven't been totally stamped out by by Eurocentrism um, and and the the forces of imperialism. So there's some, I don't know if I missed anything, but there's some little, little. Well, you know that you know that my uh, my questions aren't who knows where they start or end. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking to <laughs> uh, you know by now, so pardon to <laughs> to the audience if that's <laughs> um I, I think too, like something really generous and beautiful about about the way you've resounded this is, you know, and of course me, I mean. We're, we're kind of like a group of Indians today, which is nice, you know. Yeah, in, um, in Indians. Yeah, even when, yeah, when he gets back, we're... Um, we're but really I, hold it down. <laughs> but I think, it, you know, especially for me, be, because I think a lot about, about place, uh, relationship to place. And I think there's, some, there's such a beautiful and necessary and generous pressure that you're putting on the idea of inheritance, right? And it, it's a, it's an idea, it's a it's a notion and a practice. I guess I would say a practice of inheritance that that moves beyond property, right? Because inheritance is so closely rooted to the air and what we're leaving leaving behind in terms of the property. But what you're thinking about and what you're showing, a, a, like laying down a pathway for or joining in others' pathways that have been laid down, is like what we leave, like what what you leave and don't carry forward of yeah of inheritance. And I think that's so important to like, in that early moment uh, in the book when uh, the daughter is addressed, but but it's kind of a larger address that says like, it's so important that the, the people who've, who've uh, borne this damage, carried it, uh, mm -hmm. are telling those stories, you know, and because we have to be able to move beyond that damage, you know, mm -hmm. that the, the nation pr has projected us as damaged and it becomes a kind of prophecy. And, and so I wanna kind of take this idea then of inheritance mm -hmm. and the way it allows us to, to return to a relationality with land that is not property, that is not nation, mm -hmm. and maybe even open it up because something that feels really important to me about how the book moves and I'm thinking backward to, to no, no archive and thinking about unthinking mastery is is also how queerness and transness has been dislocated from a relationship with land mm -hmm. you know and so mm -hmm. I, I know now my question and frame is getting quite large but I think if maybe we can kind of return through the lens of inheritance and if maybe we can join each other there in some way yeah you know you know do you know what I'm going to say Natalie I'm going to tell the story <laughs> I'm going to tell the story of our becoming. Um, so, so when I came, when I knocked on your door and said, yeah, but, land back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Natalie knocked on my door one day um, and I, I had never met her before. Um, maybe, maybe sort of like opaquely through these virtual rooms. Um, but Natalie knocked on my door one day and, and came into my apartment and gave me gifts 
and I sat her down and and returned the ret- returned the. It was like the old <laughs> pilgrim trick. I'm like, yeah, some gifts uh, yeah, that. totally. Yes, I, I was trying to. I was totally trying to rock the old pilgrim trick. I, I gave her some food, um, and you totally didn't buy it. Do you remember? I gave you peppers, and I was like, these are going to produce a very hot taste in your mouth. And instead of producing a hot taste in your mouth, they produced a citrus vibe for you. And then we had this moment of like productive tension. And then you said, so when are you going home? <laughs> Like, when are you going to leave this place? That's not, that's not how it happened. You're out of sequence. Okay. I, okay. I, I don't believe in linearity, but you've just okay. so, that. So it went like this. You said, are you planning on returning to Canada? And I said, yeah, I've been here a long time and I've been thinking about returning to Canada. And you said, good, more people need to go back. <laughs> And I and I've been, you know, as you know, I've been thinking with that moment, which I which I think is the moment that really sealed our friendship, <laughs> the moment of you of you um, reminding me that I don't belong, and then being in that in that kind of space, but in a very beautiful way, like being being held by you and reminded of of the fact that that this is not my place, and and that. Um, the 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 interest for me in that is that no place is my place and so then how do we become um of consequence to 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 cite you back to yourself how do we become of consequence when when there is no place that is our place and so you know part of that for me has been about trying to abide by the potentials of what it means to be unbelonging or to return to places where to be in places where you don't belong or to return to places where you've never belonged um, and to figure out more carefully and more critically what it means to be there and so part of that unfolds in the breaks through a kind of meditation on the houses that we've lived in and the sort of strangeness as a Canadian of moving to the American South and and living in the world that is so obviously and starkly marked maybe marked as the wrong constructed <laughs> through through racialized servitude and enslavement and to have to reckon with things like the Jim Crow toilet in the middle of our basement in our first house and what to like how to, how to think with or live with or engage the Jim Crow toilet that has no walls around it that's exposed in the middle of a, a concrete basement and and what to do with it in the in, in in this world that we live in and to understand the histories of those places and I know you're always kind of angling us back toward the land um as as we said to each other the other day not the abode but the act of abiding and I keep returning to the abode I'm really interested in the abode because I think the abode in a in a in a historical and material sense as you're saying, is property, but it's property that gets narrated from on high, that gets narrated through a kind of um, national legacy or an archival legacy that is about the people who owned it, as opposed to the people who built it or the people who labored in it or the people who dwelled in it in, in queer or strange or unbelonging ways. And so I'm I'm interested now in, in the work that I'm doing now in returning to those sites such as my childhood home, if, if there are any Winnipeg people in the house. Uh, I think my mom's here actually. Hi, mom. <laughs> Natalie, my, my mom's excited that I'm in conversation with you, Natalie. Nice. Um, but a, but a, a, a project that's about that house, a house that I grew up in knowing only through a very colonial frame um, like literally the house named after a, 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 a European banker. Um, and then and then sort of stumbling into a really interesting minoritized, um, even anti-colonial archive of people who have belonged in different ways to that house, whether as employees or renters or original um, builders of the house, et cetera, et cetera. So for in that way, you know, I'm I'm interested in how property can reveal um a whole history of anti-colonial activity um organization even through things like the wallpaper or the you know the the bathtub um that allow us to kind of cycle back through history and read it against the grain 
Yeah, I mean, that's re- that's really beautiful. And, and I, again, I'm thinking toward us, toward some of our previous conversations, abode, abide, and and where we converge and diverge, which for me is, is such a, a, like, abundant space. And and I think, I think there's something, too, about what you're offering in particular toward your daughter in this book, but also offering us, again, of, of language and of wonder, um, thinking about, like, inevitability. Because I think, you know, of course, it's, it's very easy for us to jump back to, um, you know, the, the master's tools will never dismantle, dismantle the master's house. And I, I feel like, I feel like that's actually about relationship to land you know, because it's about going beyond that as, like you say, the structure, the object, the property. And I'm really struck by, um, I'm just going to, I'm going to tap on one of the, the lines, um, the two sentences at the end that you read earlier. Uh, no, I do not want to leave this planet. What I want is another world. And when I say another world, I mean this one toppled and reborn. And I'm thinking about the ways that you're looking, and, and we can dip into the nest too, because I think that's an important movement if you want to move that way, or we could also move backward in your work, because I think this is it's such a momentum. But I'm thinking a lot about the importance of origin. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, I think about that as being me being my Indian and you being your Indian, and but but how this country doesn't allow us new origins, which is why property is what it is, right? But but the ways that you're thinking of the abode in terms of like like the abode is a practice and and its possibility to have an other origin yeah. and one that doesn't ignore the the previous origin. So so it becomes a kind of momentum. Yeah. And, and that like this kind of you know rising and falling. And so for me that feels so important because the inevitability of this country will require many origins. Yeah. You know, so even as this this is happening, our nations, what we you know, the Americas, all of these, it, it, I think what you're offering and, and the fact that that you're offering it to your child mm-hmm. as as a way of moving forward, that it's at once an inevitability denying the state by creating these possibilities. But I guess I'm thinking a little bit about that, about about origin. And, you know, again, these all relate back to inheritance, but, you know, thinking of, of the, of the house, like the house that you're, Mm -hmm. that you're talking about in this particular moment. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if there's anything in there you kind of want, want to join alongside. I think it, you know, it's so large, it can go anywhere, but. Yeah. I mean, first I, I, I really love that you're taking the master's tools and, you know, I think so often we read that narrowly in relation to language. Like we, we, we don't, we don't like bring it out of that context that it's like you, you read the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And you understand it through a kind of like, we need a different language or this language. And that when we take it out of that context, although we should talk about language too, um, and you know, new, new languages or languages that we haven't, we haven't yet learned how to interpret or, or to speak or to feel. Um, but there's something really interesting about that question of um, the many, the, like the way that we can can read that in relation to land and return to land that is occupied land that is also so many other things and always has been so many other things. and is already becoming so many other things, but we don't, we're not yet. um, And I don't, when I say we're not yet, I mean, those of us who haven't had access to other worldviews or who have been so steeped in or mired in the kind of colonial education that I describe my, my child getting in this, in this book that, that you're, you're taught such a linear um, narrative that you are never able to look at the land or to feel the land in a way that is outside of the capture of that singular colonial narrative. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, this is really the emphasis you, you mentioned, you, you called it by its name, which is the nest, that project that I'm working on about the house. And I think it's like, I hope I was all right. I just, oh, it's totally okay. No, there's not a big (laughs) sneaky reveal. Um, (laughs) Yeah. And, and that the nest is the original name of the house, but I didn't, I didn't know it. And it was built by a a Métis family um, in, in, in early 
early early Winnipeg. Um, and and so part part of my thinking about that is also through the the feeling of how it felt to grow up, you know, where we grew up, where we each grew up, where you grew up, where I grew up as your Indian and as my Indian. And and for me, it was a space of whiteness and alienation and express racism and the house and the neighborhood were extensions of one another at the level of a kind of unbelonging, um, a felt unbelonging to a place. And there's something really interesting in the return to that, that narrative and the return to telling different stories about it and finding different histories about it. Um, that is really an attempt to think about kinship in much more expansive ways that is definitely about, you know, um, the relationship of our bodies to the trees that have been there for 300 plus years or um, the relations of ourselves to the other anti-colonial or decolonial activists who have lived there over time whose stories I never knew growing up and to think about how those stories for me so this project for me is a is a way of understanding that we can kind of look back at any space that has been narrativized through a colonial history and discover in that space a whole set of other stories and a whole set of other um resistance movements or um, minoritized narratives that let us understand ourselves in relation, ourselves in some kind of network, even if that network isn't belonging, some kind of network that troubles the way that we thought we were or the ways that we thought we weren't in relation to place. And for me, that's the big, you know, that that's for me the, the the sort of big question now is what do we do when we find those stories? How do we how do we dwell <laughs> coming back to abodes? How do we dwell in them and let them change us fundamentally? Um, and then what kinds of practices do we set in place collectively? Um, and maybe, you know, that project, that sort of mapping project in and of itself, I think of as a very queer undertaking. I should give a shout out here to Chase Joint, who's a, a, the filmmaker who's working with me on this, on this project, um, who many of you here know because he's a Toronto-based person, <laughs> Natalie too. Um, uh, because I think that, you know, he's really turning attention to that project through a, a kind of formulation that he calls trans as method which is really like resisting all the barriers and walls in relation to storytelling and in relation to accessibility, how we, how we step into a scene, how we undo it, how we unravel it, um, and, and how that method can be set to any kind of, um, any other kind of project that's not necessarily trans or not necessarily queer, but can be put to um, examining and visualizing and narrativizing space in in totally counterintuitive ways and by counterintuitive i mean actually totally intuitive for some of us but counter to a, a dominant logic that we've that we've inherited as the only the only way yeah i mean i think a lot when you're saying this about a catastrophe so you it's not i mean it's we're using it a lot in relationship to the environment right and climate disruption or climate change and of course i know it through thinking about like the Nakba, you know, and not the 1948, but like the one that began in the 1700s, you know, so, but I'm thinking about the importance of that and, and, and maybe setting this next to what, what was the term that, that chased trans? Trans as method. Trans as method. And, and I think this, I, I'm really struck by the way you're holding belonging, uh, because I think, I think like traditionally, the English language in particular has set set it up but also the nation again and not to like hammer things with property but has set things up so that many people are meant to feel as if they don't belong yeah right you know like my belonging is is determined by my blood quantum like I have a card that tells you how much blood I have that has been like weighed in a certain way um, but I'm thinking about the importance of catastrophe again we've been taught it's something bad but 
you know, and, and the fact that catastrophe, the way it's understood now is something sudden and unexpected. But again, like you're saying, for most of us, this is completely expected. Yeah. And, and not only is it expected, but it's something that's been wearing on our, our physical bodies, much less our stories and, you know, our inheritances. But I'm thinking about, like, if we take, I, I'm, I'm a poet, so we'll do this, but I'm taking it back to like, it's etymological, like beginnings, or at least first having been marked down, but the importance of catastrophe to, to go against the, the, what is expected, which is, makes me, when you said that, uh, of, of Chase, I was thinking of that, like, yeah, that we should always maybe go against what is expected. And I think it, it, not, not just, I mean, it, I think it happens in the archive. It's definitely happening in unthinking mastery. It, it's happening here in the breaks. And as you're thinking about the, the nest project, but I mean, what are some of the way, like, I mean, to hand catastrophe as an expectation to, to a child, uh, mm. to a familial constellation, which we are now in some ways constellated there. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, so I'm wondering like if, if you can talk a little bit about that in terms of even the archive, because I think the way, you know, Nest is working is an, a recognition of an archive of sorts at the same time of dismantling an archive. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, is there, does, we don't have to stop on catastrophe, but if there's anything to tap of it, uh, mm -hmm. it feels like such an important, um, like blooming in the book. So mm -hmm. it, it's been disrupted and it's, yeah. it's resounding in a new way. Yeah, there's, there's, you know, two, two things to say. And one is that I think, you know, it's, it's not just about undoing that other archive but really exploring it and then figuring out, and I think this was, you know, what I learned through the project of No Archive Will Restore You, which was kind of a funny project because it was really anti-archival and then a project that led me to get a lot of invites to like big archive conferences <laughs> where I'm like, I'm really scared of archives and I've never actually worked in one, um, but I wrote this book that's like shot me into this world. Um, but that book was really about, you know, thinking about the body as its own kind of archive and and by the body, I mean our bodies and their, and their um, um, always in, entangled, you know, never, never singular selves. But I think that, that for this project, for the nest, it was really interesting because I actually had to do archival work and did do archival work. And, um, and that there's something interesting to me about, you know, learning what the archive does, what the national, what the Canadian archive does, or the, the provincial archive or the municipal archive does. Um, and then what kind of other archives exist, what other sort of portals or venues we can find to explore those things that aren't contained there. And there are so many ways of doing that, right? And so, so this again sort of extends the like, what is an archive? What does it mean to call something an archive? And, and for me, um, you know, finding the sun of somebody who worked as a maid in the house where I grew up in 1935, um, as Hitler was rising to power, <laughs> like that's that's where you that's how you start to generate, you know, another those other those other stories. But on the question of catastrophe, you know, I think it's like I think that there's something really interesting about the fact that for many of us we become radicalized or woke or whatever the terminology we want to use, we start to learn, um, we have felt the force of the world across our lives, but we start to learn it intellectually, like when we're in college, you know, you start to understand, like you start to learn things like how, how things work, how they got this way. Colonization, for instance, especially in, in the United States, is like not something that students come to university understanding. And given how few people actually go to university, you understand that we live in a nation or we live in a, in a, in a nation world that really doesn't understand its own history and most, mostly won't understand it. And so I think catastrophe is, is like, catastrophe is the place to begin, which is to say, here we are, this is catastrophe. We're in catastrophe. This is the world that we're in. This is the world in which we are being family and making family. Um, and what do we make from it? Instead of the sort of 
production or reproduction of a fantasy that everything's okay. And I think it's just, you know, I think that's been, I always say about the book that it hasn't, it, it's a, it's a letter to my daughter that has an argument at its core. And I'm never sure, <laughs> I'm never sure if I actually express that argument clearly enough in the book, but the argument is if we've been trained to think about reproduction as a reproduction of the same, like I have kids and I teach them my best values and my best things. And I hope they go out in the world and do even a little better than I do, but carry forth my religion and my traditions and my practices and, you know, my, my um, socioeconomic status, et cetera, my level of education, that if we, if we stop at the end of this world in the, in the, in the moment, in the throes of this catastrophe, um, if we stop imagining parenting or mothering um, as a reproduction of the same and started to think about the production of difference within this catastrophe, then, and, and I mean the production of difference, not just for the next generation, but alongside the next generation for ourselves, like a transformation that is, ha that is here and now. Um, to me, it's the only, it's the only possible way to approach the present moment. I don't know how else you could be in relation or continue a kind of phantasmatic colonial narrative that we're still progressing <laughs> while the world's on fire. And, you know, I don't need to laundry list the things that are wrong with the world, but it is catastrophe and catastrophe is totally generative. Yeah. I mean, I basketball, it, it's a game of momentum. I always say it's a game of the future because you're just constantly reorganizing energy and mm -hmm. you know you know yourself you know you know spacing like the spatial temporal you know often by pushing against or like pressing up against another body you know or like suddenly being released into open space or you know as soon as like the tension of being up against another body releases sudden you know you're already in the next space and you know like you're taught, you never go where the ball is, you go where the ball might be. Like, so on defense, you know, like you're always, you're always two steps ahead toward what might be possible. And I'm thinking about the idea of the break, you know, that the break with me, break with me, break with me. Um, and and at how important it is to like, it's leaping. I mean, it's, it's what you were just saying right now, right? Like, and we're taught not to break. We're taught to, to again, abide. Mm -hmm. maybe I don't want to take us back to, there to abide abode a braid you know, all these things but but like the importance of that in in terms of relationality because again like we're so set on agreement it's hard it, it's hard to have a conversation about indigeneity without suddenly excluding who belongs right mm -hmm. but but there has to be a, a different momentum of breaking that a lot and like that I think is another thing that's so generous in the book is is it, it's a an invitation to break but it's it's also it's also like a model to break like like the fact that we must right like who who can possibly bear it and why would you and why would you try to maintain you know this idea of like preservation or, or yeah. ma maintaining um and so I, I guess i'm thinking a little bit if you're if you're interested in kind of talking about uh the constellation of of the books and like it, if it feels compelling to you to, to try to think of a kind of momentum not necessarily an arc or a trajectory but a kind of momentum and and how that breaking has has shifted or or how it's moving um because i think that's something that i come back to and it's like a physicality of my mind as you know, I'm thinking through the books and then arriving at, at this kind of invitation, but also pathway of, of breaking and what it means. Okay, so I don't totally know what you're asking me, but it's because I'm totally preoccupied with the basketball situation. So let me talk about basketball for a second and then return to this. Since we can just we can just go basketball. I mean, I'm dressed well, like the Royal Tenenbaums today, so yeah. that's... It's, it's, a, right. it's a very, it's, I think it's very right for the occasion, but Nace already gave all your like stats and everything. And I think I've told you, have I told you that I, that I played basketball in high school and it was kind of a life-saving apparatus for me at a very difficult time in my your life. Height. Yeah, you were. And my height post, and my 
my shoulders as you, as you like the basketball shoulders, but that unfortunately um, I had a, a, an undiagnosed visual um, impairment and couldn't ever see. And so I could feel the momentum all the time of this future oriented sport you love so much and have been so successful at, but I, and I could feel the movement of bodies, but I was always <laughs> like literally a little bit lost in space and shooting um, I guess shooting blanks has a different meaning, hey? <laughs> but <laughs> not the right term. <laughs> but 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 missing in any case. And Bricks, there's something air balls, that, yeah. Blanks. But there's something so yeah yeah sure okay got you. But, but there's something um, interesting about that as a metaphor too for like the 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 feeling momentum for a kind of decolonial impulse or a decolonial spirit where you aren't able to really see your target or you don't really know where you're shooting or you're feeling the momentum but you don't know how to angle it and i think now you know coming out of the breaks that's really where where i am like what do you okay so where do you what do you do with the energy of those bodies then where do you where do we go um for somebody who can't like actually <laughs> make the shot <laughs> Um, or, or who maybe can now with the with the the modification. Um, so anyway, I'm thinking about I'm I'm really thinking with basketball now. So thanks for that. Um, okay, you were talking about the breaks and the and the the momentum around the breaks in the book. Are you thinking like the ways in which the breaks or like the various breaks in the book kind of coalesce to become a, a momentum, or what are you thinking? Yeah, I guess I'm just wondering, like, so, so, I mean, and also, I'm, I'm also fine if, if Maze pops in with us, I think, too. Yeah, I feel like, I, I can't I, believe that she didn't when basketball came up again. Yeah, I felt like we were, yeah, beckoning, so I'm gonna, yeah. Hey. Hey. Right. Yeah. I'm adding more Indian to the mix. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so. Strengthening, strengthening the pot. Yes. Um, do you, do you feel like, I, I think Natalie's saying, like, we can, we can open. Should oh, we, sure. should, yeah, that sounds great. Things? Yeah, the conversation was so great. I just let y'all go for an extra 10 minutes, but I'm thank sure you all in the uh, in the audience who have questions and um, I don't see anything yet. So while we wait, we could just sort of continue on in this conversation. I mean, I, I learned so much from this interaction. I love the idea of being of consequence. It reminds me it's like a more poetic way of putting what Adam Phillips describes as being interesting to each other which he <laughs> defines as being uh, unavoidably compelling plus nourishing. Um, and so I love that idea of being of consequence and being, being of interest to each other mm -hmm. and abode as a practice. Um, I'll just offer like two quick questions then just to start the Q&A process. And Julieta, you can take it in whichever direction seems more generative. Uh, one links back to uh, the question that Natalie asked recently about the about the, the incantation of break with me, break with me. There's something I noticed in my most recent reading of um, the breaks, Julieta, which is that you use the word disgrace twice. And- Oh, you're gonna do this to me again, aren't you? You're gonna, you're gonna show me all the things. Okay, oh, <laughs> I'm ready, I'm ready. I'm not gonna show you all the things, but yeah, you use the word disgrace twice. And interestingly, one is in relationship to your father and the other one is in relationship to your mother. And it made me think, and this resonated with me, that there's something about, as you put it, the imperative of parenthood is a reproduction of the same, that I think always carries this sort of impending threat of disgrace, right? The, um, the, the threat of disillusionment and disappointment. And so there's something about that incantation that I just find so, so compelling, so of consequence, mm -hmm. that break with me, break with me, break with me, that seemed like an offering of grace, mm -hmm. like through the chosen loss of breaking, as opposed to the sort of the connecting over identification that leads to sort of disgrace and disillusionment. So that's just one thing I'll throw out there. And the other thing I just wanted to open it up, something that I find just so beautiful about this text, so interesting, is of course the third really important figure um, in the book, um, which is Nathan. Yeah, right? Nathan. Yeah, and Nathan, Nathan needs more props. Right, and this links back to I think what what Natalie was so compellingly describing as abode as a practice, right? Like um, through how you live together, obviously, and also just the intimacy of this this 
friendship that's not quite sexual nor not sexual, um, that is a relationship that's built around sort of talking and, and care for Isa. And um, so, yes, I was wondering if you could talk about sort of what this, what Nathan as a, as a person and as a figure does for sort of opening up that incredibly intense dyadic relationship between, between you and your child. In the day. Yeah, and I, you know, I sh maybe it goes without saying, but I guess many people here probably haven't read the book, so it doesn't go without saying, but the whole formulation of what it might mean to parent otherwise comes through conversations with my with my collaborator and and co-parent and and best friend Nathan who lives downstairs in the duplex. So part of the architecture that that um, that Natalie was was pointing toward earlier um, is through meditations on on the ways that we have queerly cohabitated over the last fifteen or so years. Um, and, and I think, you know, for Nathan, I should introduce Nathan. Nathan's um, a, an academic whose name is Nathan Snaza. Um, he went to grad school with me and was uh, very instrumental in my early life in the United States. Um, and, and, you know, we thought um, in, in queer circles and queer conversations early on, about parenting in in the way that that many queer folks think about it, which is like it's the end of the fucking world. Why would you ever reproduce? And and I think that you know there's a scene in the breaks where we have this moment as friends having a drink in in uptown in Minneapolis, and I I realize that the pedagogy parenting relation is like a very interesting one. And that while I have no biological desire or need whatsoever to have a child, that there was something like intellectually interesting to me about what it would mean to, to think about parenting, not as like a bullshit reproduction of heteronormativity, but actually as a radical pedagogical experiment. <laughs> and so um, fast forward uh, maybe a, a decade or so, and, and we find ourselves co-parenting. Um, and and trying to figure out what it means together to be in forms of relation for which we have no models, um, for which there is no language. Um, everybody always stumbles around Nathan and what to call Nathan, and there's always like kind of social confusion. And, and to us, it's so simple. And it comes back, Natalie, to the question of language that that there's no name for what Nathan and I are. We're not romantic partners. We're not sexual partners. We're not, we're just like family. And, and we're family in a way that I've never known family, which is to say we're family in a way that we are um, so of consequence to one another that we are unbreakable. And, and really, I think my relationship with Nathan is, is the first relationship I've had in my, in my significant life, <laughs> significantly long life. Um, that has that has not been subject to breaking, and so there's something about the 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 having Nathan that allowed me also to really meditate on all the other kinds or, or forms of breaking that are happening in the book, including like a, a body breaking down and a need for my daughter to break from my practices, um, and and the breaking the the forms of breaking that I've had within my own um, my own my own biological blood family. And how in, how intolerable and how wounding those breaks have been, and how much I've struggled against them, and how to think about again, Natalie, catastrophe as something that we can learn how to not resist, but actually really live toward. Um, but with that said, we also need something strong, you know. And so I think in the in the narrative arc of the breaks, Nathan is that something strong. Nathan is that thing that is that that stays very steady and sees me. In a, in a kind of like, I think I describe him as like always carefully reading and rereading me like a, like a poem or a work of philosophy that he'll keep coming over to again and again. Nace, you say like, this time I read it and I noticed twice you use the term disgrace, you know? And it's exactly that kind of close attention to text that I think we can, we can turn to each other, which is another kind of mothering, right? Like that really, really careful, beautiful, sustaining attention that we give to our art or to other people's art, to our work that we also can and, and must extend toward each other in the, in the, 
in the midst of catastrophe. I think it's like really lucky to put pressure on grace, right? Because grace is one of those, I mean, it's so Christian, right? Like it's like who, who decided what grace was, you know? And, and again, I think it's related a little bit to, to breaking, but I also think it's related to this, this relationship. Uh, There's a question that I, that I ask that my friend Dar Jamel, who writes a lot about climate disruption has offered me in like an interview conversation, but it's like, uh, I mean, it's, it seems like a stark question, but it's like, you know, it's kind of considering where, where are we now? Like, what is the catastrophe we, be, we believe we're in now? Mm-hmm. How do we believe we, how, how do we believe we arrived here? Mm-hmm. Uh, what do we think we can or cannot do about it at this point? Mm-hmm. And then like a really important question is that if we, if we cannot change it, meaning, meaning in whatever our intellectual or physical capacity as of this moment cannot figure out how to change that, how do we comport ourselves going forward? Mm-hmm. And I feel like that, that that's a little bit of what your and Nathan's relationship. And again, this constellation of care and, and again, like rigorous grace, or maybe even disgrace, like a, a discarding of it yeah. feels, feels like, because it's saying that, yeah, we know all of these things. I mean, cause you, you had mentioned like, what would it mean to reproduce or, you know, bring a child into this world. But I think there's something so essential about that that is also like a very swift undercurrent about the collective that's happening Mm -hmm. but it's like how do you comport yourself knowing you might not have the answers and it's so American to say we can't change anything until we have the answers and I mean both Americas so yeah nice you're not getting away out of it and and the the south is it's all of us Um, yeah Yeah. (laughs) but but yeah so I guess I'm thinking about that because you're asking such impossible questions and then continuing Right. It's like ans- a- asking the impossible questions, but still tilted toward like that livable life, mm-hmm. you know, which mm-hmm. I feel like is so important and, and up in so many uh, of, again, the catastrophe, right? the, the expectation. But um, but yeah, so that, I mean, that's just something that feels so generous is that even without asking the question, how do we comport ourselves going forward? It, it's just the practice is already happening. So in some ways, it gets rid of that kind of silly future model that we tend to hold ourselves to. Yeah, this is exactly what I was trying to say, but you just said it so much more eloquently about my basketball experience of like feeling the momentum and feeling the energy, but not really knowing what the hell's going on and like definitely not succeeding, (laughs) but, but still like, like having and feeling and experiencing so much potential, like raw energetic potential. Um, So in the game, in the game. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of impossible questions, there's one really big one here oh, cool. from MB. So I'll I'll ask, and I think it touches a little bit on uh, things that both of you can speak to. Um, so uh, just a practical note: if your question is in the Q and A, I'll read it out loud. And if you want to ask a question directly, please use the raise hand function. So MB asked, uh, said, "Hi, Juliet, nice to see you again. Wonderful conversation. I'm thinking a lot about war, um, and I'm wondering how." Uh, might you position your thoughts on planetary survival in relation to war? Or maybe another way of asking this is saying, what is the role of poetry in a time of war? Just a small question. Um, Can you read me the question one more time? Oh, sure. Um, How might you position your thoughts on planetary survival in relation to war? Yeah. Or another way of framing the question is, is that what is the role of poetry in a time of war? Well, I definitely think Natalie is the person to answer the question of what is the role of poetry in a time of war. But I think that there's something interesting about the 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 the, the term a time of war because it seems to me that we've always been in a time of war and we've never known a time that wasn't a time of war. And I think that's part of the reason why we're here. I don't mean to be. Um, reductive. I understand that there's an actual war that many of us are are focused on right now, um, but that there have always been other wars that we haven't attended to or haven't been asked to attend to or haven't invited ourselves to attend to. And so, you know, partly I think the breaks is a way of understanding um, our complicity in a world that has been at war 
um, without having to live as though that's the case. And I think that's really, you know, it's, it's a really interesting question. Um, but it's, it's one that for me is the, the sort of underlying anxiety that Natalie is describing, um, that we've all felt all along is in part an anxiety of, of knowing in our bodies, a state of war that is enduring, a state of war that didn't just happen, but is continuing to happen. And that is continuing literally to reverberate in our bodies and to be felt at a molecular level. Um, and, and, and how we, how we don't respond to that or how we've not been asked to respond to that or, or not been through our educations, um, through the, the, the formal, um, apparatuses of our, of, of, of our, of our life structures being invited to really dwell with. And so I think the breaks is in part an attempt to think about that always ongoing war, um, or those always ongoing wars that we haven't been asked to really live toward or live against, live into. Natalie. <laughs> well, I mean, I think you, I feel like, I feel like you're also pushing past complicity, right? Like it, it's, it feels important to me, at least today, that participation and complicity are not the same. Yes. You know, and, yeah. and I think, I feel like sometimes we get, we let ourselves off the hook, even by saying complicity, right? Like complicity, again, like etymologically, it's like to fold, yeah, to fold things together. So sometimes yeah. like when we're thinking of our complicity, it's allowing us to, to, to conflate or to fold or to uh, uh, in some ways I think there's a certain specificity like for example land acknowledgement right what would it mean to say these are the ways I'm occupying this land this is the water I'm drinking this is where it comes from this is yeah. by me drinking this water this is the reserve that's not getting water like mm -hmm. so I think there's something but but to say I'm complicit I'll do a land acknowledgement you know and I mean this is I say this about land acknowledgements all the time so I don't mean that I don't mean to like hone in on this one um, because it was also nice to hear someone actually talk about what the treaty was, which, you know, yeah. I think most people who are talking about this treaty don't know what it is. So that was beautiful and generous. Um, but, but yeah, I guess I'm thinking about, about that idea of complicity and thinking about language in general. And, you know, I have more than one language. I have my indigenous language, I have Spanish. And so in terms of poetry, like I don't think of it as a kind of activism, you know, like, like Miguel Hernandez went to the front lines during Franco's war and read his poems. That's mm -hmm. very different than what I'm doing. But it doesn't also mean that like there's a robust Ukrainian poetry uh, community the same way there is in Palestine, like beautiful, you know, Haza, like these places, Somalia, like th there are poetic traditions there. Um, and in some ways, I, I think there's a certain kind of intentionality that that is a, that that doesn't let you be complicit in a poem, maybe. I, and I actually mm -hmm. scratch that. I, I think you can be complicit in a poem, but I think there's just something about uh, at, at least a, a, a desire to be intentional about language mm -hmm. and its complexity, right? To say that, to say that it's impossible to say, you know, in some ways it's like, oh, the poets have the language. Well, we don't, but we're maybe the, the at least foolish enough to know that we don't and to try anyway, I think is, is a little bit of, of maybe how I would join this today because I do think it's, it, it's poetry could be also music in terms of like, how, how, do I, how do I use the technology of the body to let myself maybe escape the body or imagine an other body even for a moment in a time of quote war. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it's as impractical, I think, as writing poetry from the res reservation. Like, what does it even mean to be a poet from the res? I, you know, I don't, I don't know. But, but yeah. So, I mean, that's like kind of where I would join alongside, and not. I mean, it's not a. Yeah, I guess I'm just wondering about like complicity and intentionality and participation. Yeah. I'm so interested in, I understand, I guess, um, I understand the critique of complicity at the level of how it's um, like thrown out, liberally thrown out in this day and age. I was thinking about it etymologically too, in terms of folding, but I'm interested in, in your critique of it because I was thinking about it actually as more of a promise. And I realized 
or like a, a productive potential. And I realize it goes back to our, the tension around like abode versus abiding, because I think about that folding as uh, the potential for like a critical self awareness of what one is constituted by, like of how one is involved, what you folded in, what you're folded by, what you're enfolded in, it precisely in order to act, right? Um, it's like understanding the traces that you're, that you, that, that make you what you are, that allow you to be a kind of political actor or a political subject. But I'm, I'm going to, I will, we have to continue this conversation because I'm super interested in the folding as a kind of closure. Um, but I think it goes back to the nest and like, how do we think about the house as a kind of folding or a kind of complicity or a kind of enclosure that we can work with? that we can like pull the wallpaper off of or understand that we can, you know, that we can like strip down in some way. So anyway, to, to, to be continued, Natalie. <laughs> well, thank you, Julieta, for uh, bringing us back to closures and enclosures and foldings. Yes. Uh, because we are at time now. And um, I just want to express what I've hearing from folks in the chat and what I was gathering while I was receiving your conversation that that was just so energetic and beautiful and I loved sort of watching the the friendship between the two of you uh bloom uh, like within the conversation itself and it was just it was so remarkable um to watch and to be part of um thank you Julieta for sharing your work uh Natalie for sharing your your thoughts and your questions and your mothering and your care and your consequential readings um and and bringing it all in a royal tenenbaums outfit yes we mustn't you don't even know this is like head to toe this outfit yeah, I, I know. i'm like i'm like i'm not going to exercise today but i'm going to dress like i did yeah, for, the, for the win natalie <laughs> thank you so, thank you so much everybody thank you everyone yeah gracias for letting me be alongside and dream well and great to meet everybody here too. thank you everyone total pleasure thank you natalie thank you nice Thank you, Dana. Ciao, ciao.